morning, we have been dealing with the idea, the topic of being people on a journey. And we find ourselves in Exodus chapter 18, and there's some important things that need to take place in Exodus chapter 18 for us to understand. First of all, um, the law of God is given in Exodus chapter 20. So we're not quite to the Ten Commandments, Mount Sinai and all this, but Exodus 18 takes place at the foot of Mount Sinai. Black clouds, peeling thunder, the law of God coming down. That's what we're talking about. They're camped around the foot of the mountain. And one person has been kind of preeminent in all the dealings with Israel, and it's been Moses. And this is a chapter where God speaks a word into Moses' life through a, another person, and it adjusts and prepares the community of God to live in covenant with God which is really kind of cool. It says you can't do it alone. Now, I don't know if you have ever been in a situation where you feel like you can't do it alone. There's things as lighthearted as the year I got called up to varsity football. I was a sophomore. Our season ended. We went to playoffs. I was a quarterback, and I ran an end around. And as I got to the corner to plant and go upfield, there stood a guy who would become my very best friend, but at the time he was a giant ginger named Adam Norberg, and he was a massive mountain of a man, and he was grunting and kind of like, <gasps> and I was like, I want to play badminton. <laughs> I want nothing of this. He mowed me like a, you know, like a great lawn and just ran me down, hey, sorry about that. I'm so small compared. It was terrible. I came to the end of myself and I was like, I don't like that. I remember planting. I'm like, the world is his, you know, and it just, oh, everything kind of, I paled and the world got larger. And I know this, when we face circumstances in faith and in life, quite often we look at these huge circumstances and go, it's too big for me. And you know that Moses with 3 million people in the middle of the desert had to be going, I can't keep doing this. I am burning out. This is crazy. This is unbelievably weird. I'm in charge of food, water, and ministry to 3 million people. There was no church staff. There was nothing going, like he was in charge of it all. So he has this overwhelming burden on him where he comes to the end of himself. But before he kind of gets there, we have his father-in-law in Exodus chapter 18. His father-in-law Jethro comes and he brings with him Moses, his wife, and two sons. And he meets Moses at the foot of the mountain. And Moses and him have a conversation, and they talk about some things. And um, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, who is the priest of Midian, he watches Moses work for a day. He doesn't say much. He watches him work. And then in chapter, in ver in chapter 18, verse 17, we pick up the story up here. It says this. Moses' father-in-law, after watching him work, replied, What you're doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you, and you cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice, and may God be with you. You must be this people's representative. Remember these words before God and bring them and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and um, instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases, they can handle and decide themselves. That will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so, as God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain and these people will go home satisfied. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. He chose capable men from all of Israel. He made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They served as judges for the um, people at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple, they decided themselves. So we're in an agrarian society in the middle of the desert with no farms to, you know, handle. They've got all kinds of cattle and different things. We know cattle need fodder and all this stuff. And Moses is dealing with every case that comes up. Every case. From your ox trampled my tent, my family was in it, and they killed them all. Pretty serious case. To your ox eats too much grass, it gives, has gas and ruins our night's sleep. Like That's what he's dealing, the two paradoxes. Really lighthearted and really serious. And Moses is handling all of it. And God comes through a person named Jethro and says, this is not good. It's not just on you. 
And God builds what I like to say is the sociological framework for people in covenant. God builds a framework that the law can actually rest on, but it doesn't rest on anything other than people. It's the engagement of the people. So we understand that God is going to now deal with his people in mass, but on an individual level as well, in the way you live and work. And when the law of God came, it was this moment where we realize God has done something great, but we should remember in Exodus 18, God prepared his people for something amazing. God was going to come into covenant with them, and in order to do that, he had to prepare a place for the covenant to set. Exodus 18, in my opinion, is a place of divine care. It's a place where, um, it's a place where God gives this framework out to, the, out to Moses and says, you don't have to do it all. You don't have to wake up and look at the endless line of people who have disagreements and disputes that you must settle. It's not all up to you. And for us as the church, that's an important word for us to hear. It's an important word for me to hear. It is not up to me to be the church. It is not just up to you. It is up to us to be the spirit-filled, vibrant life of the church, holding together the covenant God's given us. Now, we need to separate. We live under the covenant of Christ. Christ fulfilled the law. So as we talk today about the law and the different things, we're going to look through the lens of Exodus 18 and talk a lot through that lens about the Lord Jesus Christ and the things he did. Because I believe in Exodus chapter 18, God is revealing of himself natures that will be fully lived into by the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ will take the threefold office of prophet, priest, and king. And we can see in this text, God is identifying for us two of those main three and he's leaving one conspicuously absent. So something's about to change. God's preparing to give the law, so he's preparing his people. So let's talk prophet, priest, and king. This is an important understanding for us. As Christians, we know that Jesus is our prophet, he's the priest, and he's the king. And God organizes his society with the highest ranking official. The highest amount of responsibility is given to the prophet. Moses is the prophet. He is someone who tells the truth and speaks for God. That's the highest role in the kingdom that God makes. In this community that he's creating, he gives Moses the authority of the prophet, someone who speaks the truth, but also speaks on behalf of God. And it's a critical role that we understand that um, for Moses, this is an overwhelming task. He's got to listen to God and then convey the message out to these millions of people. But the telling of truth by the prophet is mandatory. And when we look at the Lord Jesus Christ and his life, I mean, he was the prophet. He talked about things and dealt with things like when he said to his disciples of the temple, not one stone of that temple will be left unturned. I'm going to turn it over in three days. And they all kind of went, what? You can't tear the temple down in three days. But what was Jesus prophesying? He was saying that he would rebuild the temple in three days. Who was the temple that was broken? Jesus at his death, his crucifixion, his death and resurrection became the temple of the Holy Spirit. And us as Christians became the, res we are the temple. Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Spirit? So we see in this, in this prophetic nature what God's doing in Moses is a forerunner to what he's going to do in Christ. He's creating covenant with his people. So we understand that the role of the prophet and telling the truth is critical for the people of God and speaking on behalf of God. The second thing is, is this. Moses is um, a mediator between um, God and his people. Okay, that's that kind of thing. If we look at um, Exodus chapter 18, verse 19 and 20, I want you to hear this with me. And remember, this is before the law of God was given. It's kind of, a, it's gotta be a frustrating moment for Moses. Listen to this. It says, um, you must be the people's re representative before God, the prophetic role, and bring their disputes to him. And then he says, Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. Who here has more than one child? Who here has ever told their kids, now you do this and everything will be fine. One kid listens and what's the other one do? 
pick his nose, eat it, run out the window. You're like, what? Oh, man. Like, it's tough to keep two kids under control. Three million people. Three million people. And he's supposed to instruct them. What does it say right here? Um, Teach them God's decrees and instructions. He doesn't have the law yet. He's not been given the law. Have you ever asked somebody something and they have an invisible but still very shocking question mark over the head? They're like, oh, you know, like, wait, what? You say something to them and they don't get it. And there's like this question mark. Can you imagine the question mark over Moses' head? What decrees? What laws? We're in the wilderness. God hasn't told me this yet. Do you see the prophetic nature of his father-in-law, Jethro? He's acting out the prophetic role. He's saying, you've got to teach them his decrees. Moses is going, I don't have them, but they will come. They will come. God will speak into Moses' life the law of God in Exodus chapter 20. You know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The, The Ten Commandments, the rest of the law will come through Moses. But before it came, Moses was prophetically given the role of prophet and priest to mediate between God and his people. And we need to understand. Well, we'll come back to that. So finally, there's one conspicuous absent role. Do you notice that there's no king over God's people in this? God never intended that his people would be ruled by a monarch because they would be God's people for God's work. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, we see the people like, we want a king. Why did they want a king? To be like their words, not mine, all the nations around us. And Samuel is greatly offended. And God says to Samuel, don't be mad about yourself. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. Give them their king. And the book of 1 and 2 Kings and 1 and 2 Chronicles is a story of apostasy and greed and malevolence only seen at the monarch level when people are power hungry trying to get theirs. We see that when they took their own king, things went bad. But when God was their king, he would rule over them through the office of prophet and the office of priest, a mediator. For us as Christians, we're going to kind of take this and jump into current context because we need to understand that for us, We live in a different dynamic. One of the unique traits of the Reformation, we're a Reformed church. We reformed ourselves from the Catholic standards into a new set of standards. And one of those is the priesthood of all believers. It's a critical understanding for you and for me to grab onto this and know that we as Christians bear a priestly role and a prophetic role in one another's life. You're not supposed to just show up for an hour on Sunday and be like, wow, I really feel charged up. No, no, no. You're supposed to live differently and be filled with the Spirit to be a prophetic and priestly voice in the world around us. It's not an easy role. It's a painful role, but God calls us all into a new life of priesthood. And just as unexpected for us, it was for Moses too. Moses wasn't ready to be a prophet and priest. He would have rather stayed with the sheep in Midian, but God called him out of it. In the same way, he's called you and I up out of our normal everyday life and into the priestly living. There is no mediator between man and God other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That is the only way. Since we are saved by grace through faith of no works of our own, but that of Jesus Christ, we recognize he is the mediator. He is the one who gives us a sense of balance. There's the judgment of God against our sin and our sinful lives and Christ inserts himself right in between and becomes the mediator for us. He ever intercedes on our behalf and he ever speaks to his people through his word, through prayer, and through different things. We have to understand that we as prophets and priests of this faith have to engage God in his word and in our prayer life so that we can do as Peter said but you are a chosen people. We have to recognize our identity. A chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. It's an important reality that you may declare his praises, the praises of him who has really given us this gift of taking us out of our darkness and into his wonderful light. I don't know about you, but I know for me, I have come out of a lot of darkness in my own life. 
there's darkness that's been in there that God has rooted up out of me. And he's done, through, done so through the priestly voice of Christians in my life, through his word and through prayer. He calls us into a community of a covenant relationship where we gather as a whole, but we also individually know him in order that we may make him known. So for you and I, we recognize we are a royal priesthood. We live under the same ethic and command of a Moses. We must speak the truth in love and never fail to do so. But more than anything, in speaking the truth in love, we must be people who speak on behalf of God. And what did God say in Christ Jesus? That God so loved this world that he sent his only son. He didn't send another law. He sent one who would fulfill the law and then die on our behalf. The perfect one was the perfect sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Jesus, upon his death, resurrection, and ascension, commissioned us and said, go into the world. And when he said, go into the world, he gave us the priestly and prophetic identity that we have to learn, in, learn to live into. So um, here's what I want to do. Um, when I was in Lebanon, 1994, it was after, does anybody remember the, the war in Beirut back in the day? A few of us do. There was a big civil war just like what's going on in Syria. It was in Beirut, 80s into the early 90s. I snuck into Beirut with some friends in YWAM, we went into Beirut for five weeks, and I remember it was scary. It was crazy, and I thought it was awesome, but I was just not smart. And um, so we go to Beirut, and we're at an Assemblies of God church, and there's a knock on the door one day. We open it, and there is a Syrian captain in his full fatigues and his son. And I was like, oh, man. My faith was huge at this time. I was like, this is bad, bad news. We're in so much trouble. And he says, my son is oppressed, and I want you to pray for him. And the whole time, his son sat there, and his fingers were like, and he was just kind of like constantly doing this, and I was like, no, I don't want any part of that, man. It's creepy. Quit playing the weird finger game. Like, I didn't like it. I wasn't like, hey, amen, let's pray for him. I was really unnerved. So he's like, I want you to pray for him. So I was like, Lord, please help these people leave quickly. You know, I wanted to do that, but I didn't. <laughs> um, so we gather around, and we begin praying for him. And we're praying for him. I'm no spiritual giant at this time. I might be just like holding a Pentecostal handout. I was really nervous. And I remember during the prayer, this one lady named Jomana Kastandi, she said, oh, I have a pain right here. Kind of like, come on, Jomana, it's his time, not yours. You know, can we not be about you? And she's like, no, it just won't go away. It's right here, right here. And so in Arabic, we ask, is there anything on you right here, a tattoo, a, you know, whatever. Of course, tattoo is the first thought. But, you know, anything. And he unbuttons his jacket and pinned to the inside of his shirt was this little teeny tiny envelope. And I was like, oh my goodness, there's something there. I didn't know what to do with it. And I was like, oh my word. And we unbutton it, we take it out and we open it up. And it was like two or three pages on rice paper, that real thin translucent paper of curses written over this young man's, young man's life by the imam in Damascus. And I was like, that just got really real. Oh my goodness, I don't know what to do. I still, thinking about it, I was just, I was kind of horrified and overwhelmed. I was like, what do we do? So we burned it and we laid hands on that young man and we spoke a prophetic word over his life that claimed the opposite of what the imam had said. The curses over him were broken for the life that he would live in Christ. We need to understand that that life is just a breath away if we would get over the comforts we live for here for the life we are called to live in Christ Jesus. When we are so about the immediate in front of us and our prophet, priest, and king are what we want next, whatever we really want God to give us and what's immediately before us and we'll, we'll serve that until the next thing. When that's our prophet, priest, and king, we live hollow lives. But when the prophet, priest, and king of our life is the Lord Jesus Christ by his spirit, he speaks into our lives and he gives us purpose, power and opportunity to win the world for him. Not for us, not for our kingdom, but for his kingdom to come and his will to be done. So let's look at this. Let's make it live in three ways. And I want to and I want to be very clear in this. This may be uncomfortable for some of our reformed friends, which a lot of us are reformed. We're the frozen chosen. The Holy Spirit's a topic, but it's not. And I want to shatter that illusion. This is a spiritual endeavor, not a head endeavor. You can't know God if you never make him known. 
I would say you know of God the same way I know of John Elway. It borders on stalking, not so much actually knowing. We may know a lot about God, but we may not know him in relationship. And when you know him in relationship, this is what I'm inviting you to. Speak prophetically over the lives around you. Very uncomfortable for us. But we have to learn to speak prophetically over the lives that are around us. For, for us, it would be as you pray for your children, for your spouse, for your family, for your coworkers, maybe your future spouse, whomever you're praying for, speak prophetically. You have the Holy Spirit living within you. Bless them and speak prophetically over their life. Pray prophetically for the promises and claims of Scripture to be theirs. Not for blessing and triumph and a brand new truck and fifth wheel. Don't pray for that stuff. Pray for the things that last. Pray that God's word would come alive in their life and speak over them the blessings and prophetic promises of God that he will never leave them and never let them go. If your kids are a little older and like, get away from me, don't touch me, wait till they fall asleep and then go lay your hands on them and pray for them. Pray for them and speak over them. Claim the promises of God over their life and speak the truth in love. Speak prophetically, speak light, speak light and speak um, order over them. Here's, and I wanna go to the creation narrative. Do you, have you ever noticed the prophetic echo of Genesis 1 and 2? Have you ever noticed it? Before there was anything, when the wor world was formless and void, darkness hovers over the surface of the deep, God begins to speak, and as the words roll out of his mouth, nothing as of yet has happened. But God prophetically speaks into the universe and says, let there be light. Where there once was none, God spoke light, and instantly we have distinction we see light and we see darkness and the prophetic tongue of God begins to bang and echo throughout the universe. And then God does what? He speaks into the ground. Did you ever notice this in the Genesis account? God speaks into the ground. The Hebrew says he spoke into the soil like you plant a seed. God speaks into the ground and says, give up your abundance. Where there was once nothing but barren ground, God speaks into the ground. And what does it do? He wasn't like, trees, Oh, hey, that worked. No, God spoke into the ground and he called it to give forth what wasn't there and the ground gave forth its vegetation. What did God do with the waters? He spoke into the waters and he said, let the seas teem, the empty seas as of yet. Now may they teem with life and the waters obeyed God. Let us speak into the soil and water of, our li of the people's lives around us prophetically and call forth the light, the life, and the order of God in the world around us. Let us be prophets to our generation. It's uncomfortable, but if we won't proclaim the promises of God over people, my friends, who will? Who will? The second thing we have to do is speak on their behalf, and this is really important. We have lost the understanding and the art of intercession in our culture to intercede, to pray on behalf of others. It could be very easy to forget and be like, who is that girl the other day? It started with a K, I don't know. I think she's in Hungary, or am I just thinking Turkey? Like, you could get really confused, right? But you could remember and say, you know what, I'm gonna pray for Kendra. I'm gonna sign up for her newsletter, and I'm going to intercede on her behalf. Not because I'll ever know the thousands of faces she'll see, but I'm gonna pray for God to bring the faces that are ready to receive him to her. I'm going to intercede on her behalf behalf. I'm going to pray for those who will never know why or that I prayed for them, but I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to intercede on behalf of them. Be people of prayer and intercession as you pray. Ask God to reveal himself and for God to come alive in the lives of people around them so that they'll be awakened to his mercy and his purpose. His grace, his love could be experienced by people if we would start praying into their lives praying into their lives. It's not easy, but we have to learn to speak on their behalf. The best opportunity I can offer you is this. Beth Moore Conference coming up. We're partnering with Community Reformed Heart of Ike and the Foundry. We've had the sign up out for how long? A couple weeks, sign up. I think we only have two or three people signed up to pray. There's like 1,500 people in community, six, 700 here. I don't know how many at Heart of Ike, and we only have three people to pray. We've lost our, our edge on intercession. So I'm asking you, pray for these people. Sign up and say, you know what? Yes, I will commit time in my life to intercede and believe that the fervent prayers of a godly person avails much in this world. I will be a person of prayer. I will be a prophet and I will be a priest. I will pray for those around me. 
I encourage you, sign up on the back of that connection card and become a person of prayer. And I know you're like, I don't know how to pray. Many great NFL careers started with a young man who went, I think I want to play football. I don't know how, but the team welcomed him in. And then they're like, well, this man Cubs a beast. And they become this amazing football player because they were brought into a community and given a place. My friends, it's prayer. You can come in and become a spiritual giant, even if you're just learning how to pray. Even if you don't know how to pray. It's easy to learn. It's a conversation with God. We must be people of prayer, and I invite you, sign up for that Beth Moore prayer, the, being a prayer warrior for it, and learn to pray, or practice praying, or just be in prayer for the people there. There's people in our community who will come to Christ that weekend. Um, third thing, you got to learn to live like you're part of the whole body. We've got to learn to live like we're part of the whole body. You, um, you function, you're an individual, but you function within the body, right? And we all have our quirks, we all have our failings, um, we're imperfect members of the body. I have my things that I struggle with, and I think it's hilarious because um, the other week, um, Scott and Heidi Nagelkirk, they know I struggle with road rage. I know it's not godly, but I struggle. And, um, and I was leaving family fair, and they come flying up on my tail, like right up on my tail. And I'm looking in the rearview mirror, and I'm like, really? Really? Like, I didn't know who they were. And so I go to look. My neck was a little stiff, so I whip around, and I look back. And they're like, hey. I'm like, oh man, they go to the church because I was going to be like, how about I give you a beating? Like I, I was so angry. I was so ticked off. I was so embarrassed. I'm like, oh my goodness. Cause it shows that even for me, their pastor, and they had a good time with it. Remember that time you were shouting? We thought you cursed. No, I didn't. But, um, <laughs> but I wanted to beat on you. Like I, they, they think it's great, but it does show we can't put people on a level that they're not. We're members of a body. And the body must work together for the good of one thing, the Lord Jesus Christ and him being known by the world we're in. If we are going to be anything, let us be genuinely imperfect so that we can be genuinely redeemed into his purposes. We are part of a whole body. Do you not know that your life is not your own, but you were bought at a price? So you're part of this. Corinthians 12, 12 says, Paul puts it in this way, we are all members of one body the body of Christ. Paul tells us each and every one of us, we've got ears and toes and whatever parts. You've got that, whatever the analogy is to hold, but you're members of a body and you think, you know, what does it matter if a body works together well? It's the Olympics, right? Has anybody ever seen Michael Phelps do the butterfly? Isn't it cool to see that wackadoo? He's got legs that long, a torso that long, a wingspan of eight feet, and he does that kick and you're like, well, that's pretty. Right? He's just like, we're douche. You're like, I'm going to do that in the pool. And then people save you because you look like you're drowning. And you're like, well, that's tougher than I thought. Or Usain Bolt comes out of the, the blocks. And you're like, that dude, can, that dude can run. If I had to run that fast, I would do nine flips off my chin, like rolling down. I couldn't run that fast. You look at the gymnasts, and all of a sudden, they're like, you know, watch this. I'm going to do three flips and two spins. And you're like, and you'll live? Like, you know, that's like something that happens when you fall off a swing. How do you do that? How do you do that? Because their body is living as a whole. Every member working together for the single purpose of what? Every member working together for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ that he may be known out there as we know him in here. We know him in order that we can make him known. We have to live as part of the whole body. My friends, as we go into this, may we not go with any distractions. You are called to know the Lord Jesus Christ individually and corporately so that in our living the way we carry ourselves, people will look and say, now that is something different. We must let our light shine against the cultural demands and say we will not look like you. We will look like the perichoresis, the divine dance, the first community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit working together together for the creation and then redemption of the world. He has called us to the very same dance. Will we dance together in that spiritual dangerousness of being faithful Christians? The question is extended to you as it is to me. But it is extended in the hope that our prophet, the Lord Jesus Christ, said he will not leave us even to the end of the age. It is spoken in the confidence of our priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said that... If you are in me, you're a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And it's spoken in the hope 
that he is the high king of heaven. And one day, one day, the trumpet will sound and he will call all who know him as Lord and Savior back to himself. I don't have a better word for you today. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for your word, for the hope that is you, that you revealed yourself in a community so that you could come and be the Lord and Savior of all. So God, instead of our own fears and failures today, we don't pray that you would heal us of those. We pray that we would be able to have the courage to call on your name, the name that is above all names, and that we would find ourselves completely dependent, completely redeemed, and completely purposeful in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So come, Lord, and whisper a word of redemption in our lives that we who are here may see and know your goodness and in turn make that known. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, please stand. Sing with me. The living proof of the gospel lives within you and it is yours to go and live in such a way that compels the world to ask one question. What is so inexplicably different about the purpose and the meaning of the way they live than mine? And it all revolves around one thing. Who is your prophet? Who is your priest? And who is your king? Who is the Lord your God? And how must you serve him? My friends, as you go into this world this week, it won't be easy. Some of you might even hear the prophetic inklings of a life in missions. And it may be very scary. But I want to invite you to travel down the road with God. For where he leads, there you will find the most magnificent relationship that you will ever discover. And that is knowing that the Lord Jesus Christ is not only your Savior, but he has called himself your friend. And he will walk you every step of the way. As you go from this place, may you do so with the charge and the commission to be a prophetic voice into a world that's been cursed by far too many. To be a priestly voice into the life of people who maybe didn't know that there is hope beyond the darkness they live in. And in service of the high King of heaven who has called you his very own. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, my friends, you are dismissed. Have a great week.